a series where we are highlighting the life of Moses and the imperfections in the life of Moses. I feel like that I relate well to this series. The imperfections in my life I see uh, more clearly as I study the life of Moses. My, my goal today is that not, not would I simply point you to the imperfections of Moses, but throughout this entire series, we would, through the imperfections of Moses, be pointed to the perfect Christ. And that's our plan. Um, that's our goal. That's what we want. Today's sermon title is simply, God Delivers, again. God Delivers, again. Last Sunday we spoke of the Passover, and we spoke of the, the final plague on the, the land of Egypt that included the children of Israel, by the way, we made that point. <clears throat> and we spoke of the provision of the blood. We spoke about the importance of of the blood, the symbolism of the blood of the lamb or the goat in that day. The blood that, that was sprinkled over the doorpost of the house. And God said when the death angel, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. You remember that old hymn? I'm not going to sing it for you today. I don't want to embarrass myself. But when I see the blood, I will pass over you. That's exactly where we got that from. And God delivered all those that would, put, would claim the blood of the lamb over their doorpost, he delivered them from the final plague in Egypt, the plague of the killing of the firstborn. And so the children of Israel, as you can imagine, they experienced that victory of the mercy of God. His mercy was more. They experienced the victory of God's mercy, and they say, man, we're getting out of here. You remember the history lesson? They had been in Egypt since the time of Joseph. Everything was going well. There rose up a new ruler in Egypt called a pharaoh, um, kind, of, kind of like what we would say a king or a president. New pharaoh comes in town. He doesn't know Joseph. He starts realizing that the children of Israel are growing in number. He gets scared, so he puts them into slavery and oppression. And so for many, many years, they had been in slavery and oppression. And we know that Approximately 40 years ago, a, a man named, well, 80 years ago, a man named Moses was born. 40 years ago, a man named Moses wanted to help his people, but he murdered an Egyptian and had to flee for 40 years. And we know that God, in his providence, sent Moses back to Pharaoh. 40 years later, after being in Midian, after getting married, after having children, becoming just a shepherd on the backside of the desert, we know that God sent Moses to Pharaoh and said, let my people go, and, and Pharaoh went back and forth with Moses, and Moses and Aaron, his brother, uh, showed signs of miracles. They showed uh, dropping the rod down and turning into a snake. They put their, uh, their clean hand into their uh, coat and came out with leprosy, put it back in, and came out clean again, just showing miracles. And we see this victory through the plagues that the Egyptians experienced and, and, and the plagues that sometimes the uh, children of Israel experienced along with the Egyptians. And now this 10th plague, they were delivered. And we're fleeing the oppression and the slavery. Let's go. Hey, God has promised us a land back at the, in the Abrahamic covenant. God promised them a land flowing with milk and honey. Let's go. Let's get there. Thank you, God. Where's the right direction? Open up Google Maps, somebody. Let's do this. Maybe ways so we can see where the police officers are. Let's be real. All right? Let's go. God's done it. He's delivered us. And that's where we pick up the story today. Verse 10, we're going to read a lot of scripture. So either follow along on the screen closely, have your app in, in Exodus chapter 14 or your Bible. You know, Bobby, it's my iPad right here. Got my iPad. There you go. Exodus chapter 14, beginning of verse 10. When Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. Pharaoh changed his mind. So they were very afraid, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Was this a part of some plan that you had? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? 
Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt, saying, Let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. Let me repeat that. The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. Man, we probably need to put that like on the, on the fridge, maybe on our screensaver on our phones. Uh, sometimes we just need to shut up and let the Lord fight for us. We'll get there. It's coming. If you want to leave now, go ahead. All right, verse 15. And the Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. But lift up your rod and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I indeed will harden the hearts of the Egyptians and they they shall follow them. So I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army, uh, his chariots and his horsemen. Then the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gained honor for myself over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. And the angel of the Lord who went before the camp of Israel moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud went from before them and stood behind them. So it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. Thus it was a cloud and darkness to the one, and it gave light by night to the other, so that the one did not come near the other all that night." Verse 21, then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. So the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on the dry ground, and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. And the Egyptians pursued and went after them into the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. Now it came to pass in the morning watch, the Lord looked down upon the army of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and cloud, and he troubled the army of the Egyptians, and he took off their chariot wheels so that they drove them with difficulty. And the Egyptians said, "Uh, let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. We have a God who fights for us. Verse 26, then the, the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea that the waters may come back upon the Egyptians on their chariots. And on their horsemen. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And when the morning appeared, the sea returned to its full depth while the Egyptians were fleeing into it. So the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. Then the waters returned and covered the chariots, the horsemen, and all the army of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. Not so much as one of them remained. But the children of Israel had walked on dry land in the midst of the sea. And the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. So the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Thus Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done in Egypt. So the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. Speak, Heavenly Father, through your word today. In your name we pray. Amen. Number one, I want us to see this morning as we dive directly in i want us to see yet another problem yet another problem it seems that the children of israel uh, though though they were god's chosen people seem to face problem after problem and difficult circumstance after difficult circumstance and issue after issue they get over one problem and another problem arises anybody else Ever get that sense in your life? Hey, I just got over this problem, and here comes another one. God, could we maybe put a few weeks in between the problems? Yet another problem. But we must understand this morning that being God's child does not come with a life of ease and comfort. I want us to understand that this morning, being God's child does not bring with it a life of of ease and comfort. These were God's chosen people that we understand they were such 
uh, God's chosen people in the Old Testament that after Jesus came, and we've studied a lot in the New Testament since the start of our church, we understand that there even had to be the gospel had to be preached to the Gentiles because everybody knew that the Israelites were God's chosen people. And God had to say no through Jesus. Hey, listen, I am, I am the Savior of the world. But even though they were God's chosen people, obviously God's chosen people, it did not bring with it a life of ease and a life of comfort. And by the way, anybody that sells you that as Christianity is selling a false Christianity. Anyone that's selling you a life of ease and your problems will go away this morning, uh, they are selling you something that is not found in Scripture. In fact, over and over throughout Scripture, we see God's people face problems. In fact, we're told that it's going to happen. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Will suffer persecution. You see, we're not in this life as Christians to get by easy. We're not in this life as Christians to have all of our problems go away. In fact, in this life as Christians, oftentimes we have so many problems given to us that we can't handle so that God can step in. And say, only I can get the credit. Only I can handle. But God had miraculously delivered these children of Israel from the oppression, from the slavery, only to bring them to the bank of the Red Sea. The Egyptians, Pharaoh having changed his mind, the Egyptians heading their way, and they turn around and they're at the bank of the Red Sea. God, you mean to tell me You mean to tell me, God, you're going to deliver us from slavery? You're going to deliver us from the oppression of years and years and years and years and years and years in Egypt? And we're going to go and we're going to get out of that that life and we're going to flee that oppression and we're going to flee that slavery? And you mean to tell me hours later, at the most days later, we're going to turn around and find the Egyptians close on our heels. We're going to turn back around and we're going to see... An an impassable Red Sea. God, what are you doing? Anybody ever asked that question before? Let's be real. God, what are you doing? God, don't you remember what we just went through? God, don't you remember the problem that I just faced in my life? God, what, what are you doing? And I'll be honest with you, understandably, the children of Israel cry out to Moses. They cry out in anger, but I understand their anger. They even say, listen, we'd rather stay slaves. At least we were alive. I'd rather be alive as a slave in in Egypt than to be out here in the wilderness and die. What are you doing, Moses? What's going on, God? And listen, we know because we got the Bible. I don't have the heart right now to tell the children of Israel, but your problems are just beginning. There's a lot more ahead. In your quest for the promised land, there's 40 years of issues and problems and yet another and yet another and yet another and yet another problem. Don't tell them. They don't know yet. But there's more problems coming. We know as we follow the life of Moses that we're going to see hurdle after hurdle, issue after issue, problem after problem, imperfection after imperfection. And as this problem arises, I believe if we look at the life of Moses, he's quickly reminded that he is not the answer. He's quickly reminded that he is not the deliverer. He's quickly reminded that he is not the savior even though he is leading the children of Israel at this point, in their first quest out of the land of Egypt. But God quickly reminds Moses that, hey, you're imperfect. You're not the deliverer. You're not the savior. God anointed him to lead the people out of slavery only to instantly figure out that he was in an impossible situation. And by the way, as a reminder this morning, all other deliverers, all other saviors, all other heroes, all bow to the deliverer and the hero 
and the Savior. If you're in your connect groups, all judges will bow to the judge. But we see yet another problem. Yet another problem. But secondly, what do we see this morning? We see God, the ultimate provider. And you're going to notice as we journey these next 40 years with the children of Israel in the life of Moses, we're going to kind of see the same thing that we're seeing in the book of Judges in our connect groups, and that is kind of a cycle of things go well, we forget God, we fall into sin, God leaves us in our sin for a little while, we finally repent, God shows us mercy, God gives us grace, things go well again, we lose sight, it's just the cycle of life. But secondly, we see God, the ultimate provider this morning. Look at verse 13. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid, though on one side you have the, the Egyptians coming to kill you, though on the other side you have a, a, a massive body of water that you cannot cross. He says, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. Here we see what will become a recurring theme throughout our journey with Moses. And that is this. Moses never was going to be the true deliverer and savior of Israel. In this season, God will show his hand as the mighty deliverer. But he would ultimately point Israel to their true deliverer and savior. Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. Think about that and let that sink into your mind. This is the theme of our imperfect series. Is that imperfect human beings can do merely one thing. That is point us to a perfect savior. You can do no more and you can do no less this morning. You can point as an imperfect human being. You can simply point people to a perfect savior. You say, well, can I get help in other ways? Can I, can I get help in, in, with counseling here? Or can I get help with my issues and problems here? Sure, certainly there are things that we can help with. But at the end of the day, it's an imperfect person. It's imperfect people pointing to a perfect savior, pointing to a perfect provider, pointing to a perfect deliverer this morning. And I love what Moses tells the people to do here. Egyptians here, Red Sea here, what do you do? Square up and get ready. No. All right, swimming trunks, flippers, head to the water. Let's go. No, you know what he says to do? Stand still. Stand still. Similar to what Amram and Jochebed, Moses' parents, did about 80 years ago. Make the little boat, put the baby in, Moses. Stand still. Let go and watch God. Let go and watch God. Do you see the gospel evident right here in the Old Testament? Do you see the gospel theme that's displayed here? There was nothing Israel could do, nothing that they could do. Nothing. It was none of them, and it was all of God. The gospel is simply that. It is none of you, and it is all of Jesus. The Lord will fight for you. You shall hold your peace. The Lord will fight for, for you. You should simply stand still, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord. God is the ultimate provider and the ultimate deliverer, and he delivers and provides in a miraculous way in the story. He parts the waters of the Red Sea, which is miraculous in and of itself, but God takes it a step further. He doesn't just part the waters and, and leave them on their own. He parts the waters of that sea, and he makes the ground to be dry. Probably the biggest miracle. 
Can you imagine God saying, hey, I'm going to part the waters for you? He leaves it wet, and they're like, okay, <laughs> like, here we go. No, not only does God take care of parting the waters, but he goes the extra mile, and he dries the ground for them. And does he stop there? Of course not. He lets the Egyptians get in. Come on, guys. Now Moses. Bam! You know, put your hand out there. And there it goes. It all crumbles down on the Egyptians, and, and their enemies are defeated. And verse 27 says, so the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. Hey, it didn't say that Moses overthrew. It didn't say that the children of Israel overthrew. It didn't say that the Hebrew army overthrew. It didn't say that any person overthrew. It said the Lord, God, the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. By the way, Yahweh, what we spoke about two or three weeks ago. He overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. You see, I am was right there. I am was there. And God doesn't merely take care of his people this morning. He over and over again goes above and beyond to show his amazing and awesome power over the enemy and his amazing love for his people. Israel experienced an incredible victory. God, we had a problem in Egypt. Slavery, oppression, you delivered us into another problem. Egyptians, Red Sea. God comes through in a miraculous way, an incredible way, parting the Red Sea and drying the ground. What an incredible victory. Salvation of the Lord had come in that moment. And thirdly, this morning, here's how they respond. And man, do I wish we had a couple weeks here singing a song of praise. Singing a song of praise. The children of Israel responded with worship. I'm not going to read the entire chapter, but I do want to highlight some selections from what is called the Song of Moses in Exodus chapter 15. The next chapter over. The Song of Moses will be referenced numerous times in the remainder of Scripture. I'll never forget the first time I was introduced to what I feel like is biblical Bible teaching and preaching through books of the Bible, expositional preaching. I was in a service, and the pastor was in the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, it's, it mentions that they sang the Song of Moses. And instead of just glossing over it and keeping going like what I was uh, used to, I remember the pastor going, let's see what that was. Let's go back and look at it. And he began to open up Exodus chapter 15 and began to just break it down. Scripture. Let's look at it. Some selections from Exodus chapter 15. I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he has cast into the sea. His chosen captains are also, are also are drowned in the Red Sea. The depths have covered them. They sank to the bottom like a stone. Verse 11, who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? You stretched out your right hand. The earth swallowed them. You and your mercy have led forth the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them in your strength to your holy habitation. I even like this. Get ready. Then Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took the timbrel in her hand. Y'all get ready. Some of y'all, anyway, took the timbrel in her hand. And all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. And Miriam answered them. She sang back to them in response. Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. A praise service broke out. Man, there weren't just men up there singing. Uh oh. There was women leading. There was women leading with drums and dances. Just to make y'all a little uncomfortable this morning. I love it when the Bible does that. But by the way, when the Bible makes you uncomfortable, you need to be uncomfortable. 
You see, the victory was so great. The victory was so real that the children of Israel responded. And there's a, man, I'm, I'm going I'm to go on Facebook later this week in our family group, and we're going to break down a little bit more of the Song of Moses. But can I just say, they sang direct praise to Jesus, to God. They sang directly to him. They didn't sing about him. They sang to him. They didn't sing about him. Even though there's nothing wrong with singing about him, but there's something special about singing to him. My pastor in Baltimore used to always say, you could sing about somebody and they could be miles away. But you can only sing to someone who's in, the, who's in the presence. They sang to him. Not only did they sing to him, they were specific. Man, they, they wrote a song real quick and they told the story of what God had done. It'd be like if we walked up this Sunday, Tim, and you told a story about we voted last Sunday to merge with the church, and God did this, and last month we saw someone baptized, and we saw someone saved, and we wrote a song about what was just taking place, and we sang it. And then we didn't stop there. We had, we had Carla come up. Just messing with you. I wouldn't have you do this yet. There you go. We have Carla come up, and she's like, hey, Tim, I'm going to respond. And then she gets Bethany to come up with her. And then Debbie, she, you know what I mean? And, it, and here, here's the thing. It turns into an all-out praise service. It turns, out, it turns into worship. It turns into, I don't care what's going on around me. God, you delivered us. God, it is all you, and it is none of us. God, you simply told us to stand still and watch you move. Hey, listen, sometimes we need to stand still. We need to shut up, and we need to just stand back. And watch God. Stand back and watch God. This song of Moses just reminds me of the day when we'll experience ultimate victory. When we're removed from this, this body of flesh and this sin that is all around us in our culture. And that one day when we see our Savior face to face and we're in heaven. I, I had a friend of mine on Facebook this week ask, what is the most, what's the, the thing you're looking forward to most in heaven? And, and I'll be honest with you, I saw a bunch of people talking about, I want to see my family members, I want to see my mom, I want to see my grandma, I want to see whatever, blah, blah. And I'm like, man, what in the world? I had one word to put in there, Jesus. Jesus. At the end of the day, this, this reminds me of when we'll see him face to face. And the only thing I know to do that day is with my feeble voice to begin singing, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. The only thing I know to do is to say, hey, listen, I'm done singing. Sarah, get up here. Let's do it. Let's sing and bow and worship in his presence. What a day that will be, by the way. But listen, why wait for heaven? Why wait for heaven to stand beside someone from another family who's also trusted in the same Jesus that you've trusted with and the Holy Spirit inside of them is, is, is coinciding with the Holy Spirit inside of you and you guys are worshiping Jesus together like you're going to be in heaven. And that guy that you don't like the way he sings, well, he's going to be worshiping beside you in heaven. Well, I don't like that kind of Christian music. I don't care. I hope they're all worshiping all around you in heaven. Well, I don't like the old hymns. Well, I hope George Beverly Shea is right beside you in heaven. I hope he's just singing with that rich, deep voice. Well, I don't like this new stuff. Well, I hope there's a bunch of new worship bands all around you just singing and dancing. There ain't no way it's Christian rap. Man, I hope there's 15 Christian rappers around you breaking it down. You don't even know what they're saying. Listen, it's just a preview of heaven. Hey, God, you delivered us again. Again. By the way, fast forward. Again. Fast forward again, 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 and he will continue to. They sang a song of praise. We're about to do that in a second, Tim. Practical applications and we're done. Practical applications, I don't want to leave you with a story today. Even though I believe theologically we, we've connected some dots to the gospel. I don't want to simply leave you there. I want to give you some practical applications to take with you. Number one, God's realness to us is not determined by our circumstances. God's realness to us is not determined by our circumstances. I want to balance this. God may feel more real to you in the victories, but God is just as real to you 
in the problems. I would actually flip it around. Just personal for me. I feel God's realness actually more in the problems than I do in the victories. And this is a problem in my life. When there's victories that happen, I tend subliminally to take the credit. If I'm honest. But man, when, it's, when, it's, when I'm in the valley and there's nowhere else to turn, God's real. Hey, there, were, there weren't any atheists in that group of children of Israel right then. But they believe, if they didn't believe in God already, they believed. The realness of God and his realness to us is not determined by our circumstances. Secondly, God often puts us in hopeless situations so that we will realize that all our hope is in Jesus. When we are hopeless, he is hope. Tim, can you help me? Can we, you can start it right there. Can we do all our hope is in Jesus, just the chorus? I, got, I think I got it. You ready? All I hope is in Jesus. Sing it with us. Thank God my yesterday is gone. And all my sins are forgiven. I've been washed by the blood. And I've been washed by the blood. We're put in hopeless situations so that we understand that all our hope is in Jesus. And thank the Lord I somewhat stayed on key. When you're in a hopeless situation, there's only one way to look. It's not to the right. It's not to the left. It's, it's straight to him. It's straight to him. And so when you find yourself in a hopeless situation, understand that God is drawing you close. And he's wanting you to comprehend and understand that all your hope is in him. And to coincide with that, number three, practical application, God specializes in the impossible. He specializes in it. Here's an impossible situation. God goes, you're calling my name. Here's a situation that there is no way I'm getting through on my own. And God says, thank you. That's all I needed. He does it over and over and over and over and over again throughout his word. And he's done it over and over and over again throughout church history. And he's done it over and over and over again in American church history. And he's done it over and he's done it over and he's done it over again in your family history. He takes impossible and he turns them into possible. And then lastly, this is as important as anything we'll say. Our natural response to the goodness of God should be worship. Our natural response, and, I, and when I tell you this morning that my natural response sometimes to things working out for good in my life is pride, I mean it. But our natural response to the goodness of God should be worship. I'm very, I'll be, I'm very quick when things are going well to analyze and go, yeah, you know what? We did kind of make a good decision right there, and you know what? We could have done that, but you know what? We decided that was the right call, and man, things worked out good, and man, hey, you're welcome. That's my flesh. But it ought to come natural to us. Just natural. The goodness of God is brought forth in our lives, and our response is worship. Our response is worship. What is worship? Worship is simply an acknowledgement of who we are and our humbleness. Acknowledgement of who he is. And we can, we can uh, display our worship in many ways. Obviously, that, kind of, that word has kind of been uh, brought into play with music. And I, that's not a bad thing. That's one of the ways we worship. But man, we can see ourselves for who we are and see him for who he is in every aspect of our lives. Going to work tomorrow. Going to play your hobby this week. Interacting with your family this week. Worship. Worship. Another problem. 
God delivers again. Another problem, and God delivers again. I don't care what your problem is. I don't care what you're facing. You may feel like you're the only person facing it. God will deliver just like he's done in the past. He may do it differently this time. But God will deliver. Not on your timetable. Not on your watch. He'll deliver in his providence and his sovereignty. God will deliver. And then that future problem you don't know about yet. God's going to deliver you from that too. And that one you don't know about, down the road, he'll deliver you from that one. What's our response? A song of praise. Band, you can come on up. A song of praise. That's what I want us to do, church. I don't care if you're experiencing a victory or defeat right now in your life. I don't care if this is a mountaintop or this is a valley this morning in your life. It doesn't matter to me either way. What matters to me is that God has been good in the valleys and on the mountaintop. What matters to me is that it doesn't, that it doesn't matter what my, what's going on in my life right now. The goodness of God is evident. And our natural response to the goodness of God needs to be unbridled worship. Unbridled worship. Has God been good? Can you testify this morning, has God been good in your life, church family? Raise your hand if God's been good to you. Don't turn and look at your neighbor. But if you could, you could turn and look at your neighbor and say, God's been good to me. God's been good to me. Hey, can we stand?